Hi, this is Steve Hargadon. In the series of Skypecast and web interviews that we're doing on open source software in schools and K-12 in particular, we are today going to be interviewing Hilton. And Hilton, would you say your last name for me? It's Tienison. 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 Hilton Tienison. Uh, from South Africa, who's involved in the Tux Labs project. Hilton, would you tell us a little bit about uh, that project and its relationship to uh, the Shuttleworth Foundation? Fantastic. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share us, you know, our experiences with regards to putting in open source software in South African schools. Um, basically, the Tux Lab program is the aim is to build a model that. Um, uh, schools and the Department of Education and other organizations nationally and internationally could replicate. Um, and it's a methodology for using open source software within a schooling environment. We started the project as a pilot in 2002 um, and, and um, is, is, you know, three years later or since 2002, we formed a partnership with uh, 200 schools throughout South Africa to, to document these learnings and um, sort of build a cookbook for others to follow and, and replicate the model, thus increasing the use of open source software in South, in, in South African schools um, and also increasing the use and the awareness of open source software and open content, the, philo the philosophy um, in South African schools. So it sounds as though it's a combination both of the practical matter of providing the computers but also the philosophical basis of open source software. Yes, you know, um, just putting out the billboards and, 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 and doing, you know, off-stage advocacy around, op around open source software and, and, and its use within an education environment is, is just not enough to... Um, to uh, convince decision makers that open source software um, should be the proof, uh, the, the, you know, the, the technology of choice when establishing a computer room in a classroom, in a school. Um, we then decided on on a a a combination of of doing both advocacy, practical. And, 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 and building a model whereby uh, 200 schools, over 4,000 computers, over 500 teachers, uh, all those learnings could be put into a, a, a module, a document, you know, that people could follow. Now, is, is everything that you're doing based on Linux Thin Client? Um, we, we, we felt that the Linux and client technology has a number of benefits. One, you often find that in schools there's, there's you know, one or two people that has the technical know-how, um, or rather not even the technical know-how, but just the end-user capability of using a computer. So the uh, terminal server or thin client solution is, is one way the support becomes centralized, the data gets centralized, um, the software is centralized. So from a perspective where, you know, 5% of the school or 95% of the school has absolutely no technical expertise, it, it is um, beneficial to centralize all of that um, from a school perspective, but also as, as a service provider perspective. So you can remotely fix anything just on one machine instead of 20 or 50 workstations. Are these typically schools that previously have not had any computers? Um, when we did a pilot, we did a, a combination of both. We, uh, we took a school that had, uh, has never had computers, you know, they've existed for the last 20 odd years and has never had computers in, uh, for their learners. Uh, we then took another school that has computers uh, or they had computers with a Microsoft platform uh, with ailing computers and uh, showcased how the, you know, the, 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 the move to this open source platform in terms of skills is so easy on, on whether you had experience or whether you never had exposure to um, computers as a whole. 
Um, and so we decided in these 200, 200 schools to simply work with schools that has not that has never had any form of technology in their school um, and build the model from there onwards. And you mentioned that you're building or have built a document to uh, communicate what's been done. And it's the idea to have, as you said, a cookbook in which schools could actually implement this um, without your help? Yes, the, the whole idea around the cookbook is that anybody could simply replicate the model. And we would have a step-by-step -step process um, with, with, without our participation in that. Um, and so the book um, focused not only on the, the technology implementation, but soft issues around you know, having a business plan of how you're going to put this lab in and how you're going to use it, how you're going to train your staff, um, um, and, and then also how to apply the open source um, sort of volunteer component into establishing your computer lab. Because often you find that the school have budgetary constraints, finance constraints, with getting a service provider to in install a computer lab. But what you do know is that you can simply find an, an, a, a technical person out there, and, and if you can find an open source guy out there, you would simply volunteer. Um, to set up the lab. So um, it also has a component on how do you draw volunteers to help you set up this particular lab. And the we have a first, ver we, we completed version one of the cookbook, which focuses around the implementation of K-12 LTSP in, in, a, uh, in a tax lab. And the, the, the next version, which is due to come out in November, will focus on um, a complete um, seven-step implementation approach um, on, on a different platform and incorporating other platforms as well. So it would be K-12, Edubuntu, um, School of Linux, and et cetera. That's very interesting. So you're trying to bring some of those other projects into play as well. Most definitely. You know, um, the the project is not specifically to a distribution, but the aim is to say, if you're going to put up a computer lab using open source software, these are your options. We've incorporated the other distributions. We have one in South Africa or an African continent called Open Lab, and we've included that also into in, into um, the cookbook. So I know uh, at Ubuntu and and Skull Linux are both thin client solutions as well. Is Open Lab also a thin client? Y yes, yes. Is the advantage to the Linux thin client that you obviously have the centralized administration that you've mentioned, but also that it's uh, easy to get hardware that will uh, fulfill the workstation side? Yeah, you know, cost is a huge factor. Um, um, with with the the average learner paying around. Um, Mm, you know, one to two dollars per, per annum for their school fees. Um, there's obviously not a lot of money to put up a very expensive computer center in a, a in a school lab with new equipment. Um, and and as it is, there's so much you know second end or decommissioned equipment available throughout the world and even in South Africa. And so. What we wanted to illustrate is that, um, you know, with thin client technology, you can take um, old equipment and 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 make them function within the school. Um, but don't limit yourself to that because there's also new equipment that you can do the same thing with. Um, but the benefits of a, of a uh, terminal server solution has has just been fantastic for us. You know. Um, we, we we do a refresh of 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 the entire distribution that has all kinds of customization, in, including um, cache content like Wikipedia on it. And to do that in a hundred in two hundred schools, you know, within two weeks, um, if, if if we had to do that in four thousand computers, that would have been a mission. But simply having an image for two hundred servers that immediately is available on 4,000 workstations is a huge benefit for maintenance and sort of upstream downstream support 
and obviously refreshing of those those distributions over time. And it sounds like you're dealing with with something that many of our listeners may not be dealing with, which is you probably don't have internet connectivity at those schools. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, on, Af- on, on the African continent, apart from, you know, having uh, all kinds of other things that we require, one of the things that we really need is uh, cost-effective connectivity. Um, we have been able in South Africa to to have a, what they call an, a, a school rate, which is, you know, ISPs are supposed to only charge 50% for the connectivity cost. But even this cost is still very high for many of our schools, or unachievable. Um, And so what we have done is basically take things like Wikipedia and other open content as well as sort of proprietary um, South African content and made that available for offline use at the school. Um, and, and that has been fantastic because, you know, the school's business is curriculum delivery um, and not so much sort of IT skills. And uh, yes, the internet would make huge advancements for us and especially from a remote support perspective. Um, and and But, you know, you can only do that much and so having over 60 gig of content available for the schools um, is is an effective way of of delivering open content to the schools on a cash environment. Why don't we have you tell us where someone would go to find your cookbook? Um, we we're busy updating the the Tux Lab website, but the home currently is tuxlabs. dot org. dot za. So that's T U X L A B for Benny is for sugar. Um, and we're currently updating that website. The tax lab program um, for this financial financial year came into its last um, funding year at the Shadows Foundation. So one of the interesting developments for us was that the team um, of of about eight people then you know re- requested for the foundation that we would continue this project because, you know, 200 schools out there, we need to take a responsible exit strategy. And the Shadows Foundation then take, took this year's operational budget and, and project expenses and, and gave it to the team to form a social enterprise that will continue as a service provider to the Shadows Foundation, but also to the 200 schools, and at the same time um, allowing for growth of this of this model in South Africa, Africa International, um, and further driving the sustainability of this this project um, and testing its commercial viability. You know, when you say open source, people think it's free, and especially in Africa, where the subject is not very well known. And so, when you say that you can get open source software for free, people say, "Well, there must be a catch; it can't be for free." Um, and then we also have, you know. The decision maker saying, we'd like to adopt open source software, but there's no service providers, there's no skills. Um, and so we hope to answer those type of questions with the formation of the social enterprise, uh, now called Inkulu Equity Technologies, um, which means um, freedom technologies in, in, in one of South African languages. Um, and we will continuously um, update the model um, on the TaxLab tax lab website and, and would like to encourage others to then give their views and participate in building this cookbook to, um, you know, to broader than what we just, you know, we thought is, is applicable in South Africa. So in some way, you know, the, the, the TaxLab is an open source project. And as soon as we have the version two up, um, you know, we will form uh, international partnerships and 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 local advocacy groups um, to document their learnings and and improve on this particular model. You know, the same way that you would take a an open source piece of software and improve on that too. So you must have some belief that there's a pretty substantial opportunity to make a difference using the cookbook. You've done 200 schools so far. 
what, what do you see as the ultimate uh, possibility for this kind of technology in schools? How many schools are there in South Africa that you feel you, where you could make a difference? Okay. We have 32,000 schools in South Africa, and a great percentage of that being sort of um, historically poor schools. Um, and on top of this, we have um, our our government, our Department of Education, rolling out computers quite at a, you know at, at, at a good pace, an accelerated pace in South Africa, but using only proprietary software like Microsoft. We also have an agreement um, in South Africa that was signed by our president um, a couple of years ago um, for schools to have free use of Microsoft software in South Africa. Now, with that being available, there's, you know, there's, there's, you know, people ask, so why open source if we can get Microsoft for free? Um, and there's nobody that, that actually understands the concept of why open source software, you know, is better for us as, as a country, is better for our learners, it creates more, more opportunity. And we feel that the tax lab model ha creates an opportunity of choice. Um, also, um, uh, you know, what you're saying to schools, you can have both, but just expose your kids to both. Um, you know, Mark Shatter is a, is a true example of, of success using an open source platform. Um, you know, he built his entire company thought using open source software and um, have, have uh, you know, have bit the fruit out of that when he sold his company. So having an, ad, an open source um, mandate within his um, philanthropic organization called the Shadows Foundation is, is giving back to not open to the open source community, but also telling uh, youngsters in South Africa you know, the sky is the limit when, when you when you work on something like open source software. It's also telling the education department and national government and the public at large that, uh, you know, you have a choice. There's, there's something that's been around for a while and um, instead of spending, you know, three billion rand a year on software licenses, there's an opportunity to own the technology completely that you run your business on, that you educate your learners on, um, that you run your government on. Those are great points, and um, and certainly uh, I think you'd get a very responsive um, listening ear from those in the open source community who see the value to students of using open source tools and, and learning with open source tools. But again, a, a lot of this probably for these schools comes down to the, the practical matter of cost. So, yeah. so if someone was going to compare the Tux Lab solution from a financial perspective to providing comparable computing in a proprietary fashion, have you done any calculations that show uh, what the actual cost difference is? Well, um, uh, if you look at hardware, you know, there's the, you can't make a comparison in terms of hardware because hardware has a cost either way, right? Um, um, on the thin client technology, and if you and if you compare it to a, a sort of Microsoft solution, you, you're not going to pay for K12, Edubuntu, Scuola Linux, OpenLab. You can just use it, right? On a Microsoft platform, you're going to have to pay that licensing fee per per workstation that you have. And in terms of the support on on either technologies, if you don't have the support in your organization, you're still going to have to pay somebody to come and fix those things up. And and those fees differ from person to person, from organization to organization. Um, and, and then there's the training side of things. You know, you can only charge, it's the same thing that applies for from a support perspective. Somebody's going to charge you a fee to train. Um, and then open content is available on both, on both platforms, right? Um, there is a lack of sort of um, very well documented and, and aligned educational um, software uh, and, and, and content from a South African perspective. But there's a host of, you know, the web is out there that allows us to get open content and use it into our schools and so forth. So 
for me, if one had to look at the cost factor and compare the two, um, you know, you're in a win-win situation on both. Um, however, there's the, there's the question of ownership. If if there's an upgrade available on an open source platform, I can simply apply it. <laughs> if it's on the other side, um, you know, I have to buy it. A- along with that come, the, you know, the the added cost of making sure that my products now work on that new platform that I just had to upgrade. You know, if I bought something that, or if I customize something for the previous version, I have no guarantee that it will work on that version, you know, the new version, because the company didn't allow us access to the code. Um, and you often find that with um, education portals, um, the, the developers that develop on the proprietary platform, when the new one comes out, they do all kinds of things to make sure that it works. But if you were part of the development team, um, th- things become a lot easier for you. So planning your way for you know, education in any country has been around for the last hundreds of years. It will continue to be the the next thousands of years. And if we start owning, you know, technology like we own our educational content in our countries, you know, we we have a we plan our own future. And we have it in our own control. And and for that reason, you know, the comparative the, you know the cost cost of ownership um, studies and research is is one has to look about you know the long term cost of ownership and not the t- technology component you know per se. Do I sort of make sense there? No, very good points, and very interesting to think about. W- one of the great debates taking place in the United States right now is whether technology in the classroom actually accomplishes anything of academic value. And, you know, there are, there are enormous amounts of money that have been spent here to, to bring computers to the classrooms. Um, but, but there are still some really large questions here about whether that actually makes a difference for the students in their academic performance. Um, and I also uh, am interviewing Mike Huffman from Indiana tonight. And Indiana is moving to a one-to-one um, computing ratio with students, and they're doing so largely by implementing Linux. Yeah, and one of the th- one of the things they're finding is that, at least in the material that I've read, that some teachers are really unprepared to have that much access to computers in their classrooms. They don't know what to do with them. So you provide the the cookbook. I'm assuming you participate in the 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 setup of the hardware in in many of these cases, and and the technical side. What do you do about helping? them use the computers and integrate those computers into their academic programs? I think that is the one thing that we all want to get to in, you know, in all the schools in the world. Um, I think I, I recently saw studies in UK and Australia and et cetera. We, everybody has a, has, has a struggle with making um, computer equipment and the technology that we place into our schools completely and 100% effective. Um, I think it's one of those things, you know, we, the same like a calculator, it adds value and it, and it, and it enhances the resources available to a teacher to, um, you know, to, to get the outcome that it wants to achieve uh, for a specific subject. Um, similar to any other country in the world, um, it seems that, you know, the teachers that we have today was never exposed to IT while they was were studying to become a teacher, and that's where the real problem comes in. Their curriculum does not, you know, has any guideline on how to use computer technology to integrate the curriculum. Um, so the next generation of teachers would certainly, uh, this would become easier, right? Um, but, you know, in, in South Africa, for instance, in our 32,000 schools, you know, we have you know, about 30 to 40 teachers per school. And and a majority of those teachers, and especially in our 200 tax labs, have had absolutely no access to a computer in most of the cases. In fact, um, 
you would find that maybe less than 10% has, has access to a computer at home. So, you know, there's a sort of IT capacity um, process that we start up. But more than that, one of the things that we find uh, as a barrier for ourselves is that our, our teachers generally just has a very, very big fear of using technology. They think, you know, they fear that they would break something and it will cost them money. Um, and, and, and that is one of the big barriers for, for, for getting, you know, technology properly used into a school, whether, in fact, you have a proprietary platform or an, a Linux platform. Um, they would see the content on, uh, you know, Wikipedia, uh, but then using that content, putting it into a writer and then putting it into a presentation file um, and, and linking that to whatever they want to achieve. It seems easy for us as technologists, but you know it's, it's a huge dose for the schools. So what we've done is we've given them sort of mini manuals how to on, on how to achieve this. Um, that puts them through a guide, and you know we really want to make them the driver. So it's simply a a teacher guide on how to to use Writer, but at the same time include content into that and relevant content into that. So we've worked together with some of our teachers to compile these manuals as well as, you know, get some volunteers in to help them. Um, we also uh, parted with a, a, um, a sort of solution provider called Computers for Kids here in South Africa. We, you know, they've gone the other way, which is a good way, is, is taking applications and open content and then linking it to the outcomes in terms of our education system and 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 putting a manual together for teachers which is step by step on you know the next hour how does this link into your grade 2 in your social science and what is what are you supposed to say what is the learner supposed to do and it just makes it a lot easier um but that in itself is is you know unless people pay for it you know, it, it's going to be sustainable. But I figure that these guys have come up with the right solution for that, and we've included them into the program to prove that you can do curriculum delivery on an open source platform. So the, the platform that you use and the content that you use is out there. It's completely free. But there's a service provider that can show the teacher that has absolutely no confidence or a lack of confidence and skills um, would put together something and, you you know, you would buy that solution which is manuals and stuff um, and and then do curriculum delivery in the schools or achieve curriculum delivery in the schools so I'm curious as to how the students have responded to having the computers there you know we've we've had you know only positive um, responses from our kids you know you you know, for them it's a game, it's something that they haven't seen before perhaps, or, you know, they see the whole computer um, as as uh, an easy way, it replaces the teacher for them, it's the fun part, you know. Um, in cases where we've put in school uh, computer labs in very, very rural areas, we've had typed out letters that says, you know, the tax lab is the only reason why I come to school. Um, and, and we've had in, in more sort of urban areas where the teachers would feed back to us where they say, we've used this, you know, open content and, 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 and uh, open source platform. And we've seen our trouble, you know, our, our learners that has trouble learning in the classroom, excelling in the computer room. Um, and so we've, we've only had good responses, you know, but all of that only comes along with, a good teacher, a good champion, you know, behind it and, and, and taking the learner through the process. But simply, you know, kids you can put in front of any technology and they would just use it. I'm reminded of the reports that came out from the hole-in-the-wall computers yeah. that were placed in India. Yeah. And uh, the large company that was uh, right up against a uh, shanty town and just placed the computer through the wall that, that gave public access to kids that were in mm -hmm. the poorest of neighborhoods. And without any instruction, just the kids teaching each other, they determined that the, that the 
children that were using those computers had developed within a year the same proficiency level as a regular office worker in India. Yes, I agree with you. And to some degree, I think that we've, we've achieved, we've applied much of that in Tuck Labs as well. Um, we also have uh, the Digital Doorway project, which is a replication of the Hole in a Hall project in, in India. And, uh, we, you know, there's some research around that as well. And, and so, you, you know, for kids, it's easy. You put the computer down, they find this stuff. They will find this stuff. You know, when we establish each of these tax labs, the teachers and the learners um, are involved in this process. So they pull their own cable, they crimp their own networks, they set up their own server equipment, they prepare their own thin clients. Um, and, and the aim of, of that is to have an inclusive um, and a transfer of skills approach where we have the volunteers come along um, you know, that knows how to do cable, that knows how to prepare machines um, and knows about open source. And they transfer their knowledge and their skills to these guys. Because if we aren't there anymore, you know, um, at least they have some idea and have participated in building sort of their own computer lab. And, and in some cases, we've had, yeah, in some cases we've had a, a great thing. You know, in, in one of our schools, we found an 11-year-old hacking the root password. And that has been great stuff. I didn't understand what you just said. You found an 11-year-old? Yeah, this youngster participated in establishing his computer lab. Um, and uh, obviously that made him part of the, the you know, the, the sort of super user team at the school. And uh, one day we had a call from one of the teachers saying they can't add more users. The password has changed. And after investigation, we found that this 11-year-old boy um, hacked the root password. Well, you've got to give that 11-year-old boy some credit. <laughs> no, we did. We, we've been, we took him along to every tax lab install afterwards until he reached high school and he, you know, he left his primary school. <laughs> do, do, do students who just learn to use computers, aside from the lesson plans or the academic aspect of it, but just the actual use of computers, do, do they have... Uh, additional opportunities in life in South Africa than they would if they hadn't used the computer at all? Most definitely. I mean, you know, technology has just taken over the industry, um, and, you know, um, in all sectors in South Africa. Um, you, you know, you can hardly communicate with somebody nowadays um, if, if you don't have a typed up document. You know, email, email is such a, it's made such a huge impact in South Africa. Um, you know, we have a good penetration of, of, of computer technology in, in business, in government. Um, and there's a huge drive to increase access to technology in the poorer communities in South Africa. Um, so, yes, if you're not part of this and you don't have the skills, you will not get a job. It's, you know, it's, if you look at every job opportunity out there, it, it will have, unfortunately, Microsoft Word <laughs> and etc. skill. We hope that in future it will, it will be platform independent. It will just say Microsoft. Ah, it will just say word processing and spreadsheet skills. So yes, having the technology and exposure at school, it has a huge impact in many of our resource schools. You know, um, every school has at least one or two to three labs so how many, uh, take, a, take an average school or a sample school that's got a Tux lab in it. Uh, how many computers are typically in that Tux lab? How many students in the school? And, and how much time are the students actually getting per day or per week on the computers? Yeah, so we've set up a list of criteria for a school to participate in a program. Apart from them, you know, uh, have having to commit to doing the infrastructure of the lab and we give them a guide for that. Um, um, they need to have a minimum of 500 kids at the school. Right? And often you find that the ratio, you, you know, uh, educator to teacher is anything from 1 to 40 learners to 60 learners. It's, it's, it's quite a big problem in South Africa currently. We are average class is around 50 kids. Um, which is nothing like Nigeria or even that has 100 and odd kids. But anyway, um, the, the, the learners are able to get access to the computer lab at least once a week. 
um, the, the teachers are encouraged to go and and get training after you know after school hours once a week, um, and they further encourage through an incentive program to um, to use the lab effectively and give us reports. And when they give us reports, we have incentives like extra printer, extra workstations, more training, you know, mice, new mice, new keyboards, um, and etc. Um, a typical uh, tax lab would have a minimum of 20, 20 terminals connected to a brand new server and, and obviously the networking. And so how often would a student actually have access to that lab? Um, at least once a week or for approximately one hour. And and do the teachers have a similar amount of access or are they getting uh, any time alone training in the lab? Um, you know, in, in, in many of our schools, we have um, the champions at the school, which um, run um, training sessions for the other colleagues, sort of once a week, once a month, um, and et cetera. But we also, as a service provider, or, uh, you know, the, the drive of the project, have training programs for for the champions, and once the lab is established, there's an initial um, session for the teachers to expose them to the technology, find a way around it, set up the usernames and passwords and so forth. Um, so, you know, teachers are able to get access to the lab at any given time. Um, but we still have a challenge getting, you know, the, the teachers to use the lab effectively. Understood. So we probably only have a few more minutes before you need to go. Um, tell us about your role in in the program and maybe a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, well, I I entered the IT industry in '96. Learned about open source software in 1999. Uh, at that time, I had an IT company and selling Microsoft solutions, and was introduced to open source in 1999 uh, through a Danish. Uh, a partnership, um, and then um, tried to sell open source solutions in the edu education environment. Up to that point, I've already, you know, installed um, computer labs in over 300 schools in, in in my particular region, which is the Western Cape and Northern Cape region of South Africa, um, and felt that open source software is, you know, is the future for uh, for uh, historically deprived kids and, you know, the community in South Africa because um, in, in, in 99 and 2000, schools still had to pay for their, their software. And if they didn't pay, many schools pirated the software and, and strongly felt that this is a solution, you know, a, a, after my exposure in Europe of, how, you know, how open source software is used in education, I felt that this is something that needs to be implemented in South Africa. I then started this project in 2002, and fortunately for me, uh, the Shadow Foundation has just started with a mandate um, of 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 increasing the awareness of open source software in South Africa, and, and had a fund that would fund open source initiatives. And uh, after doing an initial pilot with them. Um, that proved successful um, and showed its early days, its early days of, of, of getting it to where it was today, of where it is today. Uh, I joined the foundation as 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 a project manager and led the program over the number of years to where it is today. The team has grown to a group of uh, now 12 individuals uh, passionate about open source software, uh, passionate about development and uh, passionate about getting more and more tax labs in South Africa, in Africa, and, and really make an impact internationally. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, founder of tax labs, lead, um, and and um, currently chairman of the newly formed Inkululeku Technology Group that um, drives the tax labs growth and sustainability uh, going forward. What are your ultimate goals? Um, as as in Kululeku um, Technologies, 
our, our aim is to become is to take this model and and really grow it with uh, partnerships throughout the world um, and 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 get firstly the cookbook out there um, and and getting more and more people to adopt and replicate what what you know uh, we have put together you know with, with the support and the funding of the Shadows Foundation and and continuing that you know in some way or fashion you know from an advocacy level a proof of concept level throughout the world um, and just getting the model replicated from uh, f- from a commercial perspective we would like to prove that a one's NGO product um, has its commercial viability and become a service provider to um, schools, Department of Education, uh, corporate initiatives, funding initiatives that would like to use open source software in an ICT environment and charge a fee for that. Um, so, yeah, we would like to be around the next 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years, <laughs> um, and compete with um, the proprietary solutions out there. Hilton, I really appreciate the time. Uh, and I'm glad personally to learn more about Tux Labs and, and to have a better sense of exactly what you're doing. Was there anything else that you wanted to communicate that you didn't get a chance to? I, I think, you know, uh, the, the only request that I would have from people out there is to, is to um, share their learnings through a similar approach like the Tux Lab cookbook or what we call the How to Tux Lab. And if they haven't started something yet, as soon as we have something, you know, help us develop this particular model and and document um, country implementations of this, regional implementations of this. Um, and and if all of us stand together, we could certainly achieve what 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 Linus Stolholz has achieved, which is you know the ultimate operating system. <laughs> so you know, tax labs could become the ultimate model for implementing open source software within a schooling environment, uh, applying a comprehensive approach to putting in open source software within a schooling environment. When we do open source for the simple uh, agenda of just putting open source software in the school, we forget about what their business is all about and the challenges that they face and the lack of understanding of technology that they have. So we've been you know, we've made some mistakes, and we've learned through that mistakes, and we 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 documenting that in, that mistakes, and we're saying to you, this is the mistakes we've made. Improve on it, learn from it, uh, you know, replicate it, apply it. And we would like to watch the space. You know, if I go on a tour to Australia or to US or you know wherever in the in the world, I would come to a school and they say, well, we have a tax lab. <laughs> That would be an interesting thing to see around the world. That would give you a nice warm feeling? Uh, more than just a warm feeling. <laughs> you know, doing this in 200 schools has been uh, an amazing experience. Um, I, I would like to get into a plane and volunteer in in the Hanna in, in, in replicating what we've done or just participating in that particular project and, and, and you know, going to Miami and have 100 schools running tax labs. And all these schools would own where, you know, where they're going in future. I think technology is one way of, get, of bridging the digital divide. And if we can form open source communities in education, you know, managed by the teachers and run by the educators and the principals of this world, and not as technologists, you know, as IT guys, I think open source is the way to do it. Good. Hilton, I really appreciate the time. I, I'm, uh, we're going to sign off now and express thank our you. thanks and gratitude to you.